life just never seems to turn out the way we expect it to. When David and I left for Florida on February 20th, I expected the special call general conference would approve the one church plan to create more space in our denomination for our LGTBQIA brothers and sisters. I cannot tell you how shocked and grieved we felt as we watched the division widen and we wept over the unfolding events in St. Louis. The clergy of the Michigan area met with our bishop, David Bard, yesterday, who shared his disappointment over General Conference's vote to maintain the current language and actually step up enforcement of the Book of Discipline, which prohibits same-sex marriage by United Methodist clergy and also prohibits persons who identify themselves as LGTBQI or A from being ordained. During our two and a half hours yesterday, we heard statements of organized resistance from the progressives among us. And we heard relief and affirmation of the general conference vote from our traditionalist colleagues. Through it all, there was this undercurrent of anxiety and fear for the future of our denomination. Our life together has not turned out like we expected or hoped it would. There are lots of question marks for United Methodist Christians around the globe right now. Some questions will be taken up by the Judicial Council who will rule on the constitutionality of the traditional plan which was passed last month. Some questions will be considered next Sunday among us after worship during a town hall meeting when Reverend Mary and I will share what we know and what we don't know and will give you time and space to process what you're thinking and what you're feeling right now. Other questions will continue to emerge as annual conferences and clergy and lay leadership and local churches begin to consider whether to retain our connectional structure and governance or to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church to allow new expressions of Wesleyan Methodist theology and practice to arise and develop into something that may look very different than what we have right now. Right now, we just don't know what's going to happen or what is coming next, but I would remind us that God has never guaranteed any future circumstance or uninterrupted <clears throat> tradition, not to me, not to you, not to our families or to our local church, or even to the global United Methodist Church. What God does guarantee is to be with us in the midst of it all. What God does guarantee is that even in this difficult time, God is working all things together for good. And God will indeed make the best of our current circumstances even though we don't know what that's going to look like. We simply have to trust and allow God to work in us and through us in these circumstances. And hear this, what God does guarantee is to give us meaningful work to do even in this time of uncertainty. Friends, the needs of our hurting world have not stopped. They're just as real now as they were before the vote of General Conference. As Bishop Bard wrote in his letter to clergy and lay leaders of the Michigan area, I quote, Though this is a difficult time for the United Methodist Church, with feelings running high and uncertainty in the air, 
the ministry to which God has called all of us in Jesus Christ remains. Hungry people need feeding. Those mired in poverty need people to accompany them. The addicted need to know there are possibilities for freedom. Frayed relationships need mending. Injustices need to be righted. People feeling unloved need to be loved and welcomed. Wounded people need healing. Those lacking direction need some guidance. People hungering for God need to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. People seeking to deepen their faith need opportunities for growth. You are in ministry, he writes, in different ways and in different places. And that ministry needs to continue. So when life doesn't turn out like we expect it to, what is the church to do? That is the question before us today. And I want to suggest that as we enter this holy season of Lent, the first thing we might need to do is to give up our unrealistic expectations that life is going to turn out like we expect it to so that we can learn to trust God more. As I prepared for this message, and I had to rewrite it after the general conference voted, by the way. <laughs> As I prepared for this message, two phrases from Scripture came to mind. The first is from Isaiah 40, 21. The Lord says, Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the very beginning? And then the Lord goes on to remind us of the things we ought to know. God is in heaven, God's power is sovereign, God's love is endless, God's majestic creation gives witness to God's love and power. If we will only open our eyes, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is an eternal God, the creator of the whole earth. He does not grow tired or weary. There is no limit to his wisdom. God reminds us with these words, there are things we can and indeed things we should know about God. But then using the very same words as an exclamation instead of as a question, the second phrase that came to my mind this week was a reminder that there are some things we cannot know this side of heaven. You do not know, says the Lord. Proverbs 27, 1 puts it this way. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what the day may bring forth. While I was on vacation, I had the opportunity to read the fifth book in Louise Penny's mystery series. And thank you, Barb, for introducing me to that wonderful series. I love a good mystery I love the twists and the turns and the drama and the suspense that keeps me guessing from cover to cover. As I read this past week, it occurred to me that our lives are like a great mystery book. The characters, the plot and outcome are only revealed as we go along. And that, in fact, is the exciting thing about life, isn't it? As we recall the story that Harold read to us from Genesis, we note that God called Abram to leave his country and go, and Abram went. I wonder, as I read that again, what went through his mind as he considered his direction from the Lord? Did he consider disobeying God? Was that an option for him? Did his faith overcome his fear of what might lie ahead? Or was the promise of blessing enough to drive him forward? Remember, God did not reveal Abram's future in detail. <clears throat> his future had to be played out one day at a time, one step of faith at a time, 
one act of obedience at a time. And Abram trusted God. Abram followed God's leadership. And because he did, Abram's life was transformed. And God used him in a mighty way to become the father of nations. My brothers and sisters, if we assume that life is going to go the way we expect it to, if we believe we can control what God alone can determine, we're going to be met with disappointment and discontentment and resentment. Our faith will grow weak and our hearts will grow cold. This morning, God wants to remind us that there are things that we do know and that we should know and need to know and remember. And God also wants to remind us that there are things we cannot know on this side of heaven. In knowing the difference between those things, do you not know? And do you do not know? Knowing the difference can bring us contentment and confidence and peace so that we can follow God in faith and trust regardless of our current circumstances. Only God knows what each day will bring. And God invites you and I to trust God with every day because, you see, God is in the business of making the best of our lives, of transforming us into people who are whole and holy. God is still in the business of transforming our world to become more gracious and kind, more faithful and just, more inclusive and hospitable for all of God's children, more whole and holy. In, in short, God is in the business of making us all more like Jesus. And listen, I am convinced down to my toenails that the church is still the best way for God to make that happen. It's not just one of God's strategies. It is God's plan A, B, and C. Regardless of how the church voted last month, you and I, we still have kingdom building work to do. As I look back on my life, I realize that whatever has happened, whether hard times of struggle or easy times of great joy, God has been in it all along. And whatever unrealistic expectations I have had along the way, God has always seemed to bring something better. Even when those things that God brings have been bitter medicine for me to swallow, Everything I've done along the way, God has been in it. And through it all, God continues to teach me what is needed for me to do God's will now. All of the experiences in my 61 years of life are valuable in my ministry. And thank God, God is not done teaching me yet. I close with this thought. For years, our culture has been telling us, follow your dreams and you can accomplish anything. Sometimes, for some people, it may turn out that way, but for most of the time and for most of us, it doesn't happen quite that way. Life is awash in broken dreams and disappointments, in self-induced pain and suffering. Like you, I was told to follow my dreams and I could do anything if I set my mind to it. However, my life's script, the book of my life, has not happened that way. So I don't give that advice to people. Today, my counsel is follow your God. God can take you to amazing places that are even greater than your dreams. And God can do anything. On this first Sunday of Lent, I urge us 
to give up our unrealistic expectations that life is going to happen the way that we plan or choose and take up trust and obedience to God. And through us, God can still change the world. Amen and amen.